Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside. I'm Tian Wei. After five months of hard work, the spread of COVID-19 in China is under control. Now, the discussion regarding the pandemic in this country has shifted to whether it should reopen to international travelers. With concerns about imported cases, are we going to accept living alongside the virus as a new normal? How should China's border control safeguard its people? With all of these questions in mind, I sat down with Professor Yuan Kuo-yong, who is the Chair of Infectious Diseases from the Department of Microbiology at the University of Hong Kong. He discussed how to prevent import cases while at the same time streamline the system of the so-called new normal. The latest situation, testing in Wuhan. Everyone almost in Wuhan has gone through it. Now, the new case is almost close to zero. So how should we understand the result? I think it's a good sign that there is no evidence of virus circulating in Wuhan. But that is also not that a good news because um, as far as I know, the zero prevalence, the percentage of antibody positive in the Wuhan population is low, which means that the herd immunity in Wuhan is also low, which also means if there is a reintroduction of the virus, there would be a major outbreak in Wuhan either. When we talk about herd immunity, it, it, there has to be the precondition of massive infections and also right. uh, things like that. So uh, where are we uh, if we talk about good and bad? Uh, it is both good and bad. <laughs> because all herd immunity, it means that your control measures has been very, very good. Yes. Uh, it's a good good news, but the bad news is that uh, if you cannot control the border mm. and uh, there are viruses going in with uh, incoming travelers, yeah. then you can get into trouble. Uh, once the uh, general uh, awareness uh, that all the uh, mask wearing and also the hand hygiene is getting uh, not that good because people become fatigued yes. after the, all these hygienic measures for so many months. So at the end of the day, it is both a good thing and a bad thing. And my, and my advice is that uh, uh, in Wuhan or any parts of China, including Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, we ask the government to do extensive testing. Anyone who have even very mild symptoms must be tested by RT-PCR. We must continue to wear masks. We must continue to do extensive testing to get early case detection, especially okay. in mildly individual. That's another question I want to ask you, Professor Yuan. Uh, you see some of the economies in the world already open up. Uh, some would uh, possibly be categorized as premature if you look at the guidelines of uh, WHO. However, they did open up. And therefore, uh, we are seeing a more circulation of populations among those countries. And now, uh, here comes the dilemma. If China opens up the border, of course, more confirmed cases will come in. There's bigger chance of infection and danger. However, if it doesn't open up the border, let's just say a few weeks from now, it's going to be a big hit in terms of China's interaction with the rest of the world. I don't think it is an issue at all, as long as we have the correct countermeasures in place. For example, if uh, people come uh, uh, came to China, wants to come to China, uh, they are required to have uh, RT-PCR testing five days within five days before they travel. And then once they arrive in China or in Hong Kong, they must be retested at the same time to make sure that they are not shedding the virus. And once they come in, they are always required to, mesh, to, to wear a mask, mm. do hand hygiene, and they must report to the authority, to the health authority, if they develop any symptoms. Mm. Without uh, travelers, without uh, 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 the business going on, the, I mean, the economy will be so bad that uh, it is it can be worse than the pandemic. And listen to your advice. Already a long list of things they have to do before coming here and a long list of things they need to do after coming here. They need to open up their mobile phones to the Chinese app, which some think might be sensitive too. So uh, all of these requirements have to be met before they want to make a trip to China. Of course, this is going to be complicated and challenging for every one of them. And do you I, think I that think will be that will be? I don't think it's complicated at all. Yeah. It's not complicated. <laughs> you get a test before you you travel. 
And nowadays, uh, how many tests are being conducted in New York, for example? Mm. So you get a test before you come. You come in, the test can be done at the airport. So it's not complicated. Health declaration is also not complicated. It can be done on the web. And uh, for WhatsApp, there is some sensitivity uh, because uh, you are being tracked of where to go. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is a new normal we have to accept because the pandemic situation is still there. This is what I really want to ask you. The next question, Professor Yuan. I see you are very passionate about this issue, the new normal, so-called. I think the first is we must acknowledge the need for a new normal. If you don't acknowledge the need, there is no point in talking about it. Mm. The second thing is that we now know very well that all these pandemic or emerging infections will come again and again. Mm. If do not have good measures to prevent all this emerging infection to spread, we are in deep trouble. I think from now on, every traveler must make health declarations, not just temperature checking, all the, it is a must. Second, if you have the vaccine, you must have the vaccine first, document that you really have neutralizing antibody in the blood before you can travel. But maybe you are suffering from another emerging infection that we do not know about. So all this healthcare declaration has to be in place. Now, finally, I think everybody has to recognize some very important thing, that we can no longer allow any live animals to be in our markets. Mm. Now, this is for China. A lot of Southeast Asian countries, African countries, South American countries, do have live animals in their market, even Hong Kong. We have live poultry in our market, and we have to stop such practices from now on. Fin yes. Finally, mm -hmm. we have, have another very important uh, new normal that we have to accept. Is that I think everybody in the world must have their own individualized or personalized epidemic combat kit with reusable material. Now remember, when you are using all these disposable masks, this is very environmental unfriendly, and it is very wasteful of material. Yes, We should have a mask that fit our face very well. It can be washed and be reused, and even gowns covering outside. Mm -hmm. And also, everybody should have a pocket alcoholic hand rub. So I am carrying alcohol hand rub myself. I can, sh I can show you that okay. I have alcohol. <laughs> myself All right. in my pocket so that when I touch anything, I would use this hand rub to make sure that my hands are well sanitized. I think that is another new normal that everybody has to accept. Professor Yuan, I can see you are practicing exactly what you are preaching. So that's a yes, great thing. Yes, I believe what I, I think what I think and then I talk about what I think and then I practice what I think. Though China has made great achievement on containing COVID-19, internationally the virus is still spreading rapidly and not many countries are taking control measures so rigidly as China did. In some countries, even social distancing is still not happening. On the other hand, economic difficulties together with political struggles are making epidemic prevention nearly impossible. So how do health experts see all of these challenges at the moment. Professor Yuan gives his take. I'm afraid there is a huge divide of what you, as a microbiologist, and most of the people in the world think about as the new normal. I can see that uh, pe some people would never listen to advices. Even in Hong Kong, for example, only 97% of the people wear a mask. 3% doesn't. It doesn't matter. As long as you have a majority of people wearing masks, for example, it is already sufficient to stop an infection. If one people can transmit to another people all the time, they call it the basic reproductive number one, then the epidemic will continue. But if there is more than 50 to 60% of people already wearing masks and stop the infection from spreading, yeah. if they do it correct, they do hand hygiene, Professor Yuan, you may know very well, you know, this whole, whole mm. new normal, as we say, it's not just about mm. hygiene and precautions. It's also about systematic approach. Now, 
what second thought shall we have about the public health system, whether it's China or in other countries? I think this is very clear that there are two main issues uh, in terms of this public health crisis. The first is a lack of a global system for real time, real time sharing of information. That means that the things are always delayed because every country want to investigate carefully before it inform other people, before things are being confirmed, they are afraid of uh, wrong the information and then lead to embarrassment, etc. But I think this mentality has to go. Even before we are very certain, we have to share the information so that other people know what's going on. Now, the second priority is the search capacity. And I'm sure you have heard that in France, they have thrown away a lot of outdated masks, and then they found that there are no masks to use, for example, because piling up of search capacity, piling up of masks, uh, PPE, personal protective equipments, uh, drugs and vaccines is very expensive. They have a limited uh, shelf life. Yes. Uh, you the government have to prioritize and put money into the search capacity and also to make systems of real-time sharing of information. Now, so these are the things that I saw that is very important. As a microbiologist, Professor Yuan has been among a high-level expert working group, which confirmed that COVID-19 was capable of people-to-people -people transmission. But long before COVID-19, he also fought against the SARS 17 years ago, another coronavirus which broke out in 2003, severely affecting cities like Hong Kong, Guangzhou, and Beijing. He was the one who traced the SARS back to its animal host. He advocates keeping wildlife away from humans, particularly in the market. Also, he criticized actions of politicizing the origin of the virus and calls for concrete measures to contain the outbreak together. Professor Yuan, you have been widely respected because of your contribution 17 years ago during the outbreak of SARS. You were speaking out, you were doing research about it, you were putting precautional message to everyone. What was it like at that time uh, for you to uh, dig into what exactly, uh, scientifically speaking, is happening and came up with the kinds of cautioning and suggestions then? I think one of the most important lessons that I learned after SARS in 2003 is that the uh, virus is coming from wild animals. Uh, initially, uh, we think that the, we thought that it's the seabed that is causing the problem. Later, we found that the bats, the Chinese horse bat, is most likely the ancestral, is the, the animal uh, natural reservoir mm. of the ancestral mass coronavirus. And since then, we have been doing a lot of uh, virological surveillance in wild animals. And in fact, uh, two years later in 2005, we find that around 39% of the Chinese fossil bed are harboring SARS-related coronaviruses. Mm -hmm. By two, the year 2007, we actually sound the alarm. We, write, we wrote in a review the journal the, called the Clinical Microbiology Review that we really have to be careful because we think that this uh, SARS-related coronavirus in the Chinese also bed is a time bomb. Uh, we have to be prepared. If we don't prepare, uh, then we can get into big trouble. Mm -hmm. uh, so, lesson for every one of us is that don't think that uh, SARS is going away. It's not. 2003 SARS is the first attack. Now we have this COVID-19, which is a SARS version 2. Mm. And I'm sure there are SARS version 3 and SARS version 4 coming. I'm sure that it can happen because wild bats contain a lot. They have a lot of SARS-related coronaviruses. Yeah. And they will continue to recombine the genome, exchanging gene fragments, right. and then form new viruses. We must respect the life of wild animals. They are part of our ecology on the earth. They have very important role in eating up mosquitoes and other insects mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. to prevent the ecology from collapsing. They are very useful and important animals. We should respect all these wild animals. We should not catch them, farm them, or eat them. Remember, through thousands of years, we have been living with the domestic animal like cats and dogs, cattle, sheep, etc. We are quite adapted to their viruses. So even if some of the viruses jumping into us, usually there is no big problems. Mm. But we are not living along with uh, these uh, wild animals in the past millions of years, right. uh, unlike the, the, the domestic animals. So we are not adapted to their viruses. Now, if these wild animals, viruses jump into us, we can get into big trouble, like this COVID-19 or the 2003 SARS. So I, I think that is a big lesson for us okay. that we have a new normal, we must preserve, conserve all the wild animals yeah. and their ecology and their habitats so that human can live peacefully, harmoniously with these wild animals for the next generations to come. Yeah, uh, Professor Yuan, quick question to you too. Uh, yes. We have seen the politicization of the origin of the virus. Now, one thing probably we can compare 2003 to now is the geopolitics have been tremendously different. So how do you see originally, which should be a science question, now become one of the biggest political question? I, I think that once you politicize science, this is bad for everyone because you are actually hampering the efforts of pandemic control is wrong. Uh, I can only say this, that it is a, it is a completely wrong thing to treat uh, to prevent another pandemic. If you look from a scientific point of view, this coronavirus may not necessarily come from China at all. Remember, these bats can fly long distance. They can be coming from Africa, from other parts of Southeast Asia, and then go into China. So if you ask where is the virus, it can be very far away from China. And to find them is almost impossible. So I, I think uh, politicizing all these things are completely counterproductive to our pandemic control efforts. Mm. And I don't recommend it at all. We, we should not just uh, continue to uh, stimulate each other and uh, continue the debate on something which is futile, mm -hmm. which is useless. Other because you focus on things that you have asked me, uh, what is the new normal? How should we continue to live with the wild animals? How to continue with uh, prevention, preventive efforts at airports, customs, and uh, in our daily life, how to prevent another right. disaster from coming? These are much more important than discussing geopolitics, it doesn't have anybody at all. Professor Yuan Guoyong from the University of Hong Kong, a very well-known microbiologist.